Hi, thank you for joining this presentation on the Angoff Analysis Tool. The Angoff Analysis Tool is a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet that has been pre-programmed to provide all of the necessary calculations and feedback needed to run a modified Angoff study. If you're not familiar with a modified Angoff study, uh, it is a methodological approach to developing sound and legally defensible cut scores for examinations, especially professional certification and licensure examinations. If you're not already familiar with that approach, we have another video on that topic that provides a substantial background on how, on how to run a modified Angoff study. Uh, but for now, we're going to focus just on how to perform these calculations and use them to both provide feedback to the raters during the study and to recommend a final cut score as part of a formal report. So I have two copies of the Angoff analysis tool open, uh, one with a very simple example and one with a more complex example. Let's start with the simple example first. The simple example is limited to just six raters and ten items. Uh, so you can see I have a matrix of ratings here that we've already gathered from our subject matter experts. And I've gathered a first round and a second round. And I've highlighted in three blocks there which ones have changed in the second round. Uh, this is the example that I used in the previous video, if you're interested. There are six tabs, as you can see here. Uh, the first tab just provides some overall instructions. And the second tab provides information to, to input item stats or to uh, specifically say what your projected mean and standard deviation are. Uh, these pieces of information here are used for estimating the pass rate based upon your recommended cut score uh, and then also used for deeper calculations to do what's called the Butte Compromise. Then the first round tab of course provides the first round ratings of your subject matter experts and usually what's happened is that you present the ratings uh, results of this round and they discuss it um, and then possibly revise some of the ratings to gain stronger consensus and those ratings are what's in the second round and the three highlighted spots are ratings that I have quote, changed uh, based upon feedback from our raters, which of course are just imaginary in this example. The adjustments tab is what's used for input for the Butte compromise and another method called the Hofstein method, which I'm not going to talk about today. And then the output tab is where all of the primary output uh, is presented, uh, both to provide input to or both to provide feedback for you as a researcher regarding uh, how the, each of the rounds is performing in terms of recommending cut score, as well as providing some of the statistics and graphs that you might want to use as part of your formal report when you document the procedure. So let's take a look at uh, some of the numbers that are in here. Uh, for starters, because it's a 10 item test, I've entered an uh, expected mean of six points correct and a standard deviation of one. So we're saying that the score distribution we expect our examinees, whether it's candidates or students or whoever, is going to get six items correct on average with a standard deviation of one. And then you see the first round we've got these uh, 60 ratings, six raters on 10 items, and they have uh, different levels of ratings for each item. So if I were to hide these columns and bring some of these statistics over on the right here a little bit closer, you'll see some of the feedback that it provides. So item number one in this row here, you see has an average rating of 60, uh, whereas item number three has an average rating of 72. Uh, so that means that the raters, when they looked at item number three, thought it was a little easier and expected more candidates to get it right on average. Item number seven uh, was pretty difficult, as well as item number six. You can see those were in the 50s, and whereas items three, four, and eight were considered the easiest items out of the 10 item test. The Angoff analysis tool is providing you some information on feedback for the raters and it does that automatically by highlighting items that have a standard deviation of more than 10 uh, here in this column. And so what that is saying that the the raters are providing ratings on that item that are not agreeing very much with each other. So you can see on item number one for example Raider number four gave it a 95, meaning that they thought it was extremely easy, while raiders number two and five thought it was extremely hard, think that only 40% of candidates are going to get right. On the other hand, uh, if you look at item number four, all of the ratings were between 70 and 85, so all of the raiders were very consistent. They agreed a lot on this item, and that's why the standard deviation is only 6.1 on that item. So the goal of this screen then is to provide feedback to the raters on the results of their first rounds of ratings and say, 
hey, you know, in this case, we might want to look at items number 1, 5, 9, and 10. And you disagree a lot on those. So let's find the people who had the highest and lowest ratings and discuss why you chose those ratings. So in the case of the first item, uh, let's start by rater number four saying why you thought it was an extremely easy item. Um, and then maybe raters number two and five might want to jump in and say why they thought it was an extremely tough item. The, uh, the rest of the statistics here provide similar information. You know, the min and the max obviously are the minimum and maximum information, uh, minimum and maximum ratings provided by the raters. And these columns over here are kind of like quantile buckets in that they're counting how many raters were in each uh, level of ratings. So there were two raters who gave it a rating of 21 to 40, uh, two that gave it from 41 to 60, one that was 61 to 80, and then of course there is that outlier up here at 95 that thought it was an extremely easy item. So this is another way to flag uh, the raters in terms of trying to get them to agree. You might have a rule that you wanted to have no more than two buckets adjacent. So for example, item number two, you see here nobody was in the first bucket, the second bucket, or the fifth bucket. They were in the third and the fourth buckets, and we might consider that to be acceptable. So again, um, let's say we highlighted some of those items and had the raters go back and revise some of the ratings. So what I would usually do then is copy the ratings from the first round tab and paste them into the sec second round tab here, and then just change the ratings for each one, uh, each individual cell, based upon the feedback from the raters as the discussion moves along. So in this case, we changed for three ratings, like I said. Uh, item number, or rater number four on item one, and then rater number six changed the ratings on item four and item ten. And if we hide these ratings again, these extra columns, we'll see that the standard deviation on item number one went from 18.5 down to 10.8. So that one change substantially increased the agreement on that item. And item number four, it went from 6.1 up to 7.1. And item number 10, it went from 17 down to 9.5. So overall, we, we improved the consensus by reducing the standard deviation on two items substantially. Uh, and we'll see later just how much that actually improved it. In real life, you'd probably change more than three and you get even greater consensus here. But for now, we're just trying to keep it simple and only changing those three ratings. Uh, then what we do after the second round is we ask the raters to provide the Buke estimated pass rate. So that's telling them uh, to look holistically at the test and estimate what percentage of minimally competent candidates would pass this test um, overall. And the raters are generally saying, you know, 60-70% of candidates should pass, which is typically what you see in credentialing exams. So then we can move to the output tab, and the output tab is providing us the output on the first round and the second round side by side so that we can compare them. We can see the first row of the tables here, that's the average rating, that's the panel recommended cut score. So that's saying that the panel is recommending a cut score of 6.58 out of 10 on uh, the first round and 6.52 out of 10 on the second round. So they didn't change their average rating very much. However, the standard deviation of the ratings uh, dropped from 0.37 down to 0.30. And the inner rater reliability, uh, which is uh, calculated using a Shrout and Fleiss uh, intraclass correlation coefficient, it improved from 0.312 all the way up to 0.684, so it more than doubled. So th those three changes that we made, um, even though there was only three out of 60, the ratings that were changed had sufficient leverage that they greatly improved our inter-rater reliability. The inter-rater reliability is then used to calculate the standard error of the judgments. And then we can also do a classical st standard error based upon the sample standard error, the mean. Uh, but the, the IRR based one is definitely more uh, applicable in this case. Uh, we also provide the minimum and maximum, uh, as you see here, and the max possible points just to provide a frame of reference. You'll also note that there's two columns in each one, uh, providing on the raw scale, in this case it's out of 10 points, and the percentage scale out of 100. And you can see, of course, here, because 10 and 100 are multiple of each other, it's the two numbers are pretty comparable. Uh, they're not going to tell you anything different. But if you had, let's say, 140 items on your test, well, then it, it might be a little easier for you to work on the percent scale rather than the raw scale. 
the projected mean and the raw mean that you see down here are just plugged in from the, the previous tabs uh, where you entered them. And we also provide the number of raters uh, just so we can make sure that that is consistent in each round too. Then on the bottom here is where uh, it gets a little more interesting. So what it's doing is it's taking that projected mean and standard deviation that you inputted it on the item stats tab and comparing it to the recommended cut score and estimating what percentage of examinees will pass with that cut score and then also what examinees would, would pass if you take the recommended cut score plus or minus one standard error of judgment. So after the first round our recommended cut score is 6.58 plus or minus the standard error of judgment gives us 6.88 and 6.27. Now because our average expected score was 6 below that cut score we'd expect less than half of our candidates to pass and that's exactly what these numbers are telling us. That 39, 28, and 18.96 percent are kind of the expected pass rates that we would have here. In the second round you'll see similar results uh, because the cut score only changed from 6.58 down to 6.52 so the numbers aren't substantially different. Next let's look at the Butte Compromise. So the Butte Compromise tries to balance uh, between the panel recommended cut score based upon the Angoff only and the expected pass rates uh, based upon those Buke ratings that I showed you in the Adjustments tab. So it's saying that in this case the panel recommended a cut score of 6.58 and that would lead to a 28 percent pass rate. However if you go look at the ratings here and look down at the bottom it's saying they're expecting an average of 67 0.5 percent of examinees to pass this exam. And that's definitely nowhere near the 28 percent based upon the cut score they just sent. So the Buke tries to find a medium in between that, between the 28 percent pass rate and the 67 percent pass rate, and it recommended a 50 percent pass rate which would lead to a cut score of 6. And the way it does that is using this graph that you see over here on the right, basically by looking at the pass rate for each possible score on the test, which is the red line, and then a B line, which is a slope based upon the, the ratings. And it's not very clear here because there are only 10 items on this test. It'll be a little more clear when we look at the, most, the more complex example. So let's move on to that example. That's a little more realistic. Uh, in this example, you can see that it's a 200 item certification test, which is more feasible in real life. And we've just put in a projected mean of 140 and standard deviation of 7. Now you can uh, provide these from different methods. You can just type them into these two blue squares here, uh, or if you've got a P and RP biz for all the items on your test, you can enter them here and the spreadsheet will calculate the mean and standard deviation based upon those. So we've got our first round of ratings, and again there are six raters, but you can see if, as I scroll down here there were 200 items. And the second round had six raters again of course, and 200 items. The adjustments uh, were the same ratings here for this, the Buke estimated pass rates. So let's hop over and look at the output table. And you'll see the numbers are quite different here because we're dealing with a 200 item test. So instead of 6.52, it's now 136.91 is our panel recommended cut score. A little lower than the expected mean of the test, which was 140 points out of 200. The ratings for round one had an interrated reliability of 0.752, while round two uh, increased to 0.889. And in real life, you're more likely to see a moderate to negligible increase in interrated reliability like you see here. The first round of the simple example that I had had a lot of disagreement because there was only 10 people. Then again, in certain cases, you'll find a lot of disagreement around your panelists, especially if they come from a wide range of backgrounds. And having the second round is going to be essential. And in fact, both the second round and the Buke serve to provide as a level of quality control over the whole modified Angoff process because in many cases that first round you're going to have a, a lot of disagreement, especially if there's a, a wide range of backgrounds like I mentioned, um, especially even more so if, if the subject matter experts are not discussing the concept of a minimally qualified candidate sufficiently so that they're all calibrated into the same idea of what a minimally competent candidate is. So you see in the results here, because we had a recommended cut score of 136.91 and a average score of 140, our pass rate is now above 50%, it was 67%. And because that uh, recommended pass rate of 67% is not far off from the 
Buke uh, estimated pass rate, uh, the Buke turned out to be not very different in this case. Uh, it only changed from 136.91 to 137, and that had very negligible effect on the estimated pass rate. The second round had a little higher panel recommended cut score, which of course led to a slightly lower estimated pass rate, but you'll see that the Buke recommendation still did not change. And if we look at the Buke graph, you'll see it's a little clearer now. Uh, what it's trying to do in the red line is say what is the pass rate for, that we, we would have if we set a cut score at each possible point in the test. And because there were 200 points on the test and an average of 140, you know, a cut score of 80 or a cut score of 100 or a cut score of 16, of course, are going to lead to a 100% pass rate. Everyone's going to get a score above that. On the other hand, a cut score of 176 or 192 is going to lead to a 0% pass rate. Well, a cut score of 140 is going to lead to a 50% pass rate because that's where the average score is. And then it, it calculates this red line for every possible score on the test. And the green line uh, is beyond the scope of this discussion here, how that's calculated. But for now, you'll note that the two intersect. And the point where that intersects, that is where the Buke compromise is actually located. So the spreadsheet goes and finds that intersection and then populates what those numbers are into this table here for you. So that's a brief overview of using the Angoff analysis tool to drive the modified Angoff discussion process as well as analyze all the results to ensure that you've got a legally defensible and psychometrically sound cut score for your credentialing exam. Uh, if you have any more questions, uh, please get in touch with us. Uh, we'd be happy to provide some help and especially that's especially true if you are in need of a modified Angoff study or some other sort of standard setting study and do not have the in-house expertise to feel comfortable with running this on your own. Our expert consultants are there to help and we can provide you consulting at a number of different levels to ensure that you're meeting international standards in terms of how you're developing your assessments. So I'll provide some contact information in the description below, but our website is www.assess.com if you'd like to go visit it right now. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and join us for a few more in the future. Thanks again. Bye.